My name's Sasha Pete, and I'm joined by a fantastic individual, none other than the great Fausto Diamichis and Socceroo. Welcome, Fausto, to this conversation. Sasha, thank you for having me, and I appreciate you pronouncing my name extremely well. You must be a bit of an Italian background, mate. <laughs> so, no, I'm, um, I'm actually, the dad's Hungarian and the mum's Greek, but I grew up in the western suburbs of Melbourne, and so, you know, we had Italian, Greek, Macedonian, you know, uh, Croat, uh, and so we we have this nuance, and I, uh, I tried uh, try my best to pronounce people's names right. But uh, we we we're here to talk about your uh, your the what your playing career. Tell us, fast off, how did you first fall in love with our great game? Um, if if I really have to go back from the very very beginning, um, as a child growing up, because I grew up in Italy as a child. Uh, my father was a caretaker, basically um, like um, it, was, it was actually the, 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 the team's caretaker of all the clothing, basically looked after all their, um, you know, washing all their clothes. So he worked at a club there in Italy in Pescara, which is in Abruzzo, in the Abruzzo region, and, um, and that was his job, you know. So he, uh, he washed clothes and prepared their bags and uh, cleaned their boots and, you know, made sure that they're, uh, you know, they were ready to go for travelling, for training, whatever it may be. And, and uh, as, a, as, a little, as a little tacker, um, my brother and I would, uh, would go down at the club um, and, uh, and we were, I was only probably about six years old um, and my brother would have been at the time nine years old. Um, he's three years older than me. And uh, yeah, we'd be we'd go down to the club and and um, believe it or not, just kick the ball in the dressing rooms. And then we got to, obviously the players got to know who we were, all that sort of stuff. We were only little kids, so they had a little bit of fun. They'd sometimes give us gifts. And believe it or not, back in the uh, in the early seventies, a gift was getting a little Coca Cola bottle from one of the uh, the players and say, "Here, have a Coke." Um, so we were pretty spoilt uh, back then to have a Coke. Um, uh, but yeah, no, we started there and, and then from there we became ball boys. So there's that, you know, we've actually got photographs here of, um, me and my brother-in-law standing, um, at, uh, at Pescada's home ground, the, uh, Stadio Adriatico, um, where we would be ball boys, um, for, for the team, um, when, when obviously for the home games. And during the warm-ups, me and my brother would collect the soccer balls and bring them back when they were, you know, shooting or whatever it may be. So uh, that's how we fell in love. We fell in love, both of us, with, uh, with the game and, uh, you know, we continued with our football journey. That, that, that sounds uh, fascinating. So talk to me, Pescadas uh, in that stadium, how many fans would be there at any given home game? Well, look, we're not a we're not a very very big club. We've we've sort of we've fluctuated a lot. Well, the clubs fluctuated a lot from um, from um, C B set of cheer set of B. They've been in the set of R. Um, I think the only time it was probably full, um, like by nine. From what I remember, the story from um, a very good friend of mine who I still speak to in Italy. Um, at nine o'clock in the morning, the stadium was full for a three o'clock kickoff because Napoli was coming down with Maradona to play against Pescara. <laughs> um, how many would it seat? You know, probably maybe about 20,000 people. Yeah. Maybe. I'm not quite sure. But, um, I mean, it's been upgraded. I, I was last there in 2014. Um, we were at a – we had to go to a wedding. And um, because uh, because my love for that club is, uh, is still, you know, really, really close to me and my uncle took over – my father's job when we migrated basically to Australia, mm. um, we w we had access to the ground for the wedding, so the groomsmen and the bride could take photographs in the goals, um, oh, yeah. sh shooting. Yeah, yeah. So they opened up the, the stadium just for us to go in there, and it had changed a lot from when when I left it uh, many many years ago. Although back in the very late eighties, I think it was eighty nine ninety, I went there for a for a training session with the uh, with their first team and. Leo Jr., I remember quite vividly, he was their main man back then. And they were in Serie A at the time. And, uh, yeah, I just had a training session with them. It was a really good experience just to go back where I grew up. And, and so playing ball in the, in the streets, you know, school, uh, obviously Italy, you know, football mad. When did you play first formalised football? Did you play for that club as a junior? No, not at all. Because then in '76, when I was eight years old, we came to Australia, and okay. we were only we only came back to Australia. Uh, my father decided to come back uh, for a two-year 
just for two years. So my brother and I could obviously learn a, um, English. back to Italy sorry back to Italy although I was born here I was born here uh, but I was only we were only three months old when mum and dad migrated back to Italy mm. and basically where we lived and where the stadium was we were in between the the, um, the Adriatic Sea so we had the ocean and and the and the stadium right behind us so we were in the middle so 200 meters to the left was the beach and 300 meters to the right was the stadium so my father found a perfect nesting for him, so uh, he could go to the beach when he could and obviously um, enjoy his soccer. So, um, yeah, so when we came back here in 76, we were only meant to be here for two years. So um, obviously the first year was to understand a little bit of Australia and where we were, and we were situated in, um, in Hawthorne, basically, with my grandmother. And I think it was in 78 is when I started my first um, first club level football and as a as a un, under tens, um, and that was at Brunswick Juventus at Sumner Park. Yeah. Hey, so, where, where the the dip where you have to we kick the balls and they end up in the river. I've played. You remember? Yeah, you mm -hmm. remember? Yeah. So <laughs> our pre <laughs> our pre seasons there as little little fellas, I remember juniors was to run up the hill and come back down. That was yes, our pre season. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yeah. yeah. Don't kick the ball too hard, or else it'll end up in the in the in that yeah, little in uh, stream or river, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it was a creek, Mary Creek. Mary Creek, yeah. So uh, that that pitch um, of a winter, it can get bogged. You make make sure you wear your studs, or you're slipping and sliding. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, a lot definitely. of history, Brunswick Juventus. And did you play there for how long? Uh, I played there uh, for about fourteen years. So oh, I played wow. there till 1990, well, basically 1991, and then I, I went over to uh, to George Cross for one year. Ernie Merrick at the time in 91 um, paid, believe it or not, at the time at the NSL, um, uh, George Cross, $5,000 for me to be on loan in wow. 1991, yeah, to Juventus. And I, I played with them for one year, and then I went back for one more year at Juventus, then I moved across to the NSL. So, yeah. so 14 years at Brunswick Juventus. Yeah. Obviously, steep history in that club. Massive. Deep, deep Italian roots. One, uh, arguably the, the original. Uh, no doubt. Um, uh, and uh, obviously the, the, the history there. You played. You played uh, your your senior football as a defender, but as a junior, what part, where where did you gravitate to on the ground? Yeah, that's another story, isn't it? <laughs> um, so through Juventus, I'd play as a striker and as a midfielder always. You know, striker. Look, I was pretty. I was. I, I'm, I'm you know, not the biggest player in the world, but I was very. I was pretty quick. I was pretty fast. Yes. Um, and um, so coaches would either play me as a striker, but predominantly in the midfield. And, you know, that's where I played basically the early junior years until I got to about uh, 16, 17 years old. Um, and uh, then Manfred Schaefer, he came and took over the team. And uh, him and I got along really, really well. And I think he enjoyed the type of person I was and the footballer that I was. And I think because he liked me so much, <laughs> he actually put me right back. And the only reason why he put me right back, and he told me, he goes, I like you, I like you. So, you know, he said, I like you as a player, I like you as a person. I'm going to play you where I used to play as a right back. I said, but that's not where I want to play, mate. <laughs> doesn't matter how much you love me. <laughs> but uh, I thought, you know, if this is where I've got to play, I'll, I'll just take the opportunity. And, you know, he was a lovely man. He was a fantastic person. I, I, I really enjoyed my time with Manfred. Yeah, um, so... Yeah. The uh, what 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 a legacy coaching legacy he had in Australian football. Uh, Magnificent, yeah, yeah, big big legacy. The um, so do you remember your first senior game? How old were you when when did you break into the senior team? Uh, probably first senior game I would have been with. Uh, Roughly how old? Um, yeah, I would have probably been about seventeen years old, 17, 18 years old. Wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and talk was... to me. Talk to me of the names in the dressing room. Who are the Who are the people that you're looking up to to say, okay, okay. I'm on the fringe. I'm in the I'm in the twos, right? As a 16, yeah. 17 year old, and now yeah. I'm training with the first team. Yeah. That that trying to nestle in because Juventus is a big club at that time. Who, no doubt. Who Who are the na biggest names in the dressing room? Okay, so you, you <laughs> Brian Brown, 
John Eisendorn, Peter Lewis, um, uh, John, uh, was it Campbell? No, no, not John Campbell. Uh, Dowie, uh, John Dowie, Fabian Cantalupo was there. Um, Andrew Zinni was there. So um, you, you, you're, you're naming many soccer Joe Sweeney. There. Many, 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 Joe, Joe Sweeney, did you say? Yeah, Joe Sweeney, and a person who I've always remained friends with and uh, um, and who I really enjoy playing with because he helped me a lot, and that was Sean Lane because at the time oh. I ended up playing from right back, I ended up left back, and Sean was, it was like left midfielder, left winger, and he helped me a lot. He yeah. helped me a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it actually it, – now it doesn't surprise me how good because you were very good on the ball, right? You could play, right? So the the um, it, it doesn't surprise me at all that you played in the midfield and up front. And that's why I asked that question to try and typify the people because when people see you play in the NSL in the later years, yeah. I want to understand what, 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 are, what is the makeup of your progression. So yes. uh, that explains your ability on the ball. You were quite fluid. You could – Yeah, yeah, you could, absolutely. You, you could, you could absolutely. Look, they helped me. They helped me they helped me a lot like these players helped me a lot and you know not and not forgetting you know i was fortunate enough to be on the park with mickey peterson and scott oh. patterson you know i mean they were just amazing and, and mickey p was just phenomenal he was a, a, an extremely um kind very very kind and extremely helpful full of a lot of advice um i remember one particular training session we used to train at victoria park in brunswick and uh, and I got a real serious tackle from uh, Scotty pa uh, Scotty Peterson or Patterson. Um, it was a real a real bad tackle on my on my shin, and that, you know I almost could have broken my shin. Mm -hmm. Mickey P came up. It was basically at the time we were reserves versus the seniors, and yeah, it was a really bad. But I never forget this, and I remember saying this story even when I joined South Melbourne and Mickey P was retiring. Um, you know, the legacy of Mickey P for me was, you know, he came and picked me up off the ground and he said, mate, you're going to be a really good player one day. He said, get yourself up, keep going. You know, you'll always get our, you'll always have my support. And lo and behold, you know, we're still friends today. You know, he That's was just right. magnificent. Yeah, yeah. And I, th I actually thought I broke my leg that day. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so yeah. We're, we're talking about, we're talking about uh, a tough time. So what year was this? You talk about this tackle. What year was this? Uh, we were talking around the around about eighty six, maybe eighty seven. That was the championship side. Yes, that was the Juventus eighty five, eighty six championship wow. side with Lynn McIndry when they when they won the uh, the NSL. I mean, wow. it was a big team. It was yeah, a big, big 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 team. I remember. So back back in those mid eighties, it was I think uh, two tier competition, Northern. Uh, division, yeah. Southern Division, Southern Division yeah. and Juventus won that. I think it was either eighty five or eighty six. They beat Footscray JUST yeah, yeah. in the final at Olympic Park. Massive, uh, big, yeah. Andrew Zinni, uh, uh, Johnny Eisendor. Yeah, yeah, they big, were all big, there. big team, yeah. big team. Reno, and, Reno Minichello was a great player at the time. He was playing for them too. You know, yeah, yeah. So, and big personalities too, right? So. Massive. Massive. Yeah, Fabian Catalupo, uh, funny in the dressing room, champion, champion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a clown. <laughs> I yeah. tell you, it was a clown actually, because Paul Wade was there at the time too, and uh, and Wade he was uh, it was a little bit of a clown too. You know, he was a really good leader. He was a really good captain. Um, you know, like he let he let the boys well. Uh, Brian Brown was an excellent leader. You know, oh, yeah. So um, talk about now 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 you're pulling out names. So the uh, yeah, but Peter Lormitz, Peter Lormitz in goals. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had Peter Lormitz in goals. We had um, – His uh, hair was so flamboyant for the time, you know, that, that – Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the <laughs> Yaka Banovic, he was in goals too. Oh, wow. So um, another, another soccer look, I was so fortunate. I was really, really fortunate. But, you know, the fortune comes with, you know, with hard work. So you talk about, I mean, uh, you, you talk about, so was, was Lenny the coach at the time or had it already been shifted off to Schaefer? Yeah, it shifted off, yeah. But at that time, it was Len McKendry. That's when he was there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, obviously, Chris, Lenny just, Chris, uh, passed. just passed. Um, yeah. So, Vale, Lenny, Kendry. So, um, the, uh, so Schaefer, what, how, how, how tough was he as a, as a, as a coach? I tell you how tough he was. Pre-season at Footscray. He made us run the basically the showgrounds, okay, at, at Footscray. But he didn't make us run inside the showgrounds. He made us run outside the yeah, showgrounds on. on the on the footpath. <laughs> now we we're all running. Listen, this is this is incredible. We were all running, obviously, with runners, and he would run with us. And that's how fit he was. He was just an amazing, 
He was the strength within himself was just incredible. So we're all running with our runners, and all you could hear behind us is click, 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 click. He's click. running with studs. He's running with studs. I'm not <laughs> kidding. <laughs> He's right on the footpath around the show, Melbourne showgrounds on the footpath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He were they, were they, so, I mean, being German descent, what, where did he gravitate to? Was it Puma boots or Adidas boots? Which one do you I remember? I remember. Could have been Adidas. I, <laughs> I think it could have been Adidas. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I tell you, it probably, you grind them at the end of the session. You know what I mean? You yeah. <laughs> Just change the studs, ready for the next training session. Now, he, look, he was lovely. He, um, he helped a lot. He was, he was a type of coach that, um, that, you know, you would listen to. You know, he was, yeah, you'd really listen to him because you knew of his background, and, and you know, and all he expected were you was for you, to, you know, the respect in return, um, and you did that, you know, and and uh, yeah, no, he he was he was really good to work with, really really good to work with. And you, you talk about uh, football and friendships and being like lifelong uh, f- friend now with Mickey P. Yeah, probably arguably the best deliverer of the ball. Okay. Yeah of that generation, the ability to look at somebody and ping it um, yeah. and that person running 20 yards and yes. it'll be on a dime. He could predict the pace at which that person's running yeah. and deliver that ball from one side of the pitch to the other and maybe not a better deliverer since. Like, you yes. know, you think about what does, you know, the engine of Paul Way, the delivery of yes. that long pass from Mil- Mickey Peterson, he, he, I think he would be in that top percentile of player, the ability to get the ball and ping it along. No he doubt. Magician no doubt. at that. Magician. No doubt. Inside of the foot, outside of the foot, in different positions. But that was, that was um, you know, he mastered that. He knew he knew that role really, really well. And um, as I said, if he, he could sense the movement, the ball was going to be placed there. You know, mm. um, you know he, he was very, very good at all that. You know, distribution of the game, distribution of the ball, Changing of position, um, you know, Mickey P was uh, was you know probably the best in, at that very one, much best yeah. in that in, in that era. Excellent, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And yeah. obviously, uh, many many caps for the Socceroos. Uh, I think it was fifty that, something caps, fifty fifty one caps. I think. Yeah, yeah, many caps for the Socceroos in around that time as well. Yeah, and so, a gentleman off the park, absolute oh, gentleman off the right, park. Right, yeah. right. And um, so, do, is there a particular game at uh, a Juventus that you like? You remember fondly if you. Like if you could bring back that that memory, is a one or two particular games that, that spring to mind. You go, okay, if I could replay that moment, what would it be? Um, oh, well, there was there was there was a lot. There was many many occasions. There was once there was many that I didn't play. I sat on the bench, yeah. you know, obviously because of the the senior team that that, yeah. that I was in. Um, especially as a as as trying to break into that particular squad when uh, Len McKendry was the coach and Joe Caruso was a team manager, you know, mm-hmm. he was another legend of, uh, of, I mean, he, he knew how to run, how to run a club uh, or a team really, really well. Um, but probably, probably more so um, was the, the time when um, uh, Billy Rogers took over. When mm-hmm. Billy Rogers took over of the team, by that stage, we had come back down to, the state, state league. Victoria state state league, and that's when I really, really then cemented my position in that in that team yeah. in, uh, with the club. And Billy Rogers once again, he helped me a lot, like just mentally. Um, you know, there was a big exodus of that side too. Uh, when, yeah, yeah. when the re- when the re- relegation, a lot of the boys went on. You know, Andrew yeah. went on to to Preston. Preston to the, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there was you know. Port yeah, Fab, I think Fab moved on to at that yeah, stage. Okay. We still had, I think Brian Brown might have still been with us for a little bit and Steve Smith was still around at the time, okay. both Steve Smiths, because then we had Steve Smith coming from Preston to us there at um, at, uh, at at Juventus at the time. Sean Lane was still there. Um, you know, once again, you know, so, you know, Paul Donnelly, some really, really good boys, really good players, but, you know, really nice people nice people to play with and I'd say that's when I probably that's when I really really cemented um, my senior senior uh, position and that was late 80s early 90s with with Juventus um, and that was with Billy with Billy Rogers because don't forget we also had uh, Vieri Robert Vieri he um, he coached us Roberto Vieri came from Marconi to coach us um, 
at uh, at Juventus. Um, I think that would have been around about the could have been about the eighty eight or eighty nine, something like that. That era there, I think it was. Talk about a sliding door moment uh, there. Obviously, his son went on to yeah, yeah. You know, play in a um, you in know a World Cup. I think he was in a World Cup. Cup. He played in Italy, Serie A. He's a legend over there at the moment. You yeah, know, obviously, yeah, magnificent, yeah. magnificent. Yeah, so imagine. I mean, we had uh, imagine if we had uh, if he stayed in the country. So yeah, what yeah. what would it mean for for our soccer stock? So yeah, absolutely. Um, what was what was his uh, was he traditional Italian? Uh, yeah, look, very traditional. The, the the issue the issue that you know what. The players found, I mean, it was okay with me, but a lot of the English players found is that he couldn't speak English. So his communication to the players, you know, was a little bit difficult. You know, it was very difficult. It was very broken did English. You, did you, did you, were you the translator or who was the <laughs> I tell you what, almost to an extent, yeah, I, I would be. Uh, but, you know, uh, you know, uh, Joe Mirabella was also uh, at the time, you know, the, being uh, the president. So he would also help out. Um, with uh, with some of the translations, but realistically, you know, they, they were smart footballers. They 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 you know, Robert basically just had to put on a session, or uh, and the, you know, the players. The were football smart. did the talking. The football yeah, did yeah. the talking. Understood. Yeah. yeah. And um, so now you you talk about uh, Merrick uh, wanting to put on loan. George Cross never had any money at that time. <laughs> so for them to shell out five grand for you yeah. to go on loan, that must have been a big call by Ernie wanting you to to, to play for him. So yeah. what brought that on? Well, I, look, I I had a I had a, a, a you know very good season um, with Juventus, and at the time we um, we with Billy Rogers, we had just won the uh, the state league championship yeah. and that's probably one of the going back to what you know what games do you remember the most and I know and we were at Footscray and we had to win that game and um and anyway we ended up winning we ended up beating I think Borlean came second at the time we ended up winning by by a point or so yeah. um so look you know I, I was having a pretty good season I've had probably two good seasons with with Billy Rogers and uh and yeah I look I just captured the uh you know the 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 the, the imagination, I suppose, of uh, of uh, Ernie Merrick of, of of having me fit into his squad because Damien Murray was at the time also with us at uh, at Juventus, okay, and Damien Murray went across to, to George Cross. George Cross, yeah, and yeah. and Ernie Merrick, and, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, he could see way ahead of many many uh, others probably that didn't see. Uh, he had put on you know a George Cross team. That was very, very young, but had a lot of prospect. You know, Lawrence Kidner. Um, you know, obviously John Waddell was there, uh, uh, was with us there. Uh, Damien Murray. I mean, there was a lot, a lot of young players. Uh, David Clarkson, who, who who became a champ. Uh, you know, uh, an Australian champion. Um, you know, he put and Kevin Musker was actually with the reserves at the time. Wow. Well, yep. Yeah, so um, and and Craig Foster, Paul Foster were both there. Both of the Foster brothers yes. were there. Um, I remember yeah. the era. Gary Hasler, he was yeah. there. What yeah, a hard so man! Was- you, talk, you talk about somebody who was silky smooth on the ball, Lawrence Kidner. Yeah. What he could do. So Amazing. Lawrence, Lawrence actually. Um, ended up after his time at Belgium, ended up playing at my boyhood club, Western Suburbs. So my local club is Western Suburbs Soccer Club in Sunshine. Yeah. And Lawrence ended up coming back and finishing off his career with us and just still super screwed. But as a, as a young star, somebody who, you know, like I just like as a, you know, as a late teen just he played played football with ease. You know, some players just yeah. you find – just he easier than others, right? He breezed through, yeah. yeah. And it's like he it's made it simple, you know. Like, think about Hasler for Hasler, he, he, had, he worked for the ball, <laughs> right? But Lawrence would just be able to, like, a, a breeze that coming through, and, and that's what reminded me of him coming through that George Cross side, as opposed Fantastic. to. Gary would w- work for the ball, right? <laughs> um, yeah, interesting what George, what er- Ernie did. You could see yeah. he didn't have the budget. For the likes of, let's say, South Melbourne or yeah, Petra, the Marconis, but he's going for talent, right? Yeah, yeah. And you can see why later on he he was so good at developing Victoria. Well, Melbourne, yeah, Melbourne Victory too. I mean, look yeah. what he did for Victory, Melbourne Victory, and he moved on. But you know, he had um, Ian Greener with him too as an assistant. Yep. Um, so as I said, you know, it was a really young squad with a couple of senior players, and Sean Keogh was in goals. You know. Yeah. 
another another you know i mean these are really really good people you know really good like human beings apart from footballers um and they were always um you know they're always there especially some of the senior players were always there to make sure that uh you know if you know some of the younger boys but by that stage we were getting a little bit older too um, you know, make sure that everything was was you know kept kept down to earth and made us feel comfortable as as, as footballers. Um, so we didn't have a successful year. As no. a matter of fact, I think only America th that um, ended up being dismissed by George Cross and they brought in Tony Vizina towards the yeah. end. Um, but you know, we, I really enjoyed my time with Ernie Merrick. Um, he gave me a lot of opportunity. Exposed me to the NSL. Um, yeah, he did pay five thousand dollars. I don't know where he got that from. Like you said, you would have been, been, been a sponsor. It was a lot of money for an owner. It was a lot, a lot of money. Sorry for a loaned player. That was a yep. lot of money back in ninety one. That's yep. a lot, a lot of money back then. Yep. Um, but nevertheless, you know, I enjoyed it. Um, I had a really good experience, a really, really good time there, and um, and then went back to Juventus for one last year. Yeah, and uh, and then we played that year. We played in the grand final against. Um, North Geelong, we ended up losing that at uh, Footscray, Footscray Oval there. Yeah. Um, I think it was 3-1. We were winning 1-0, but we got 3-1. We, we got beaten by a fantastic North Geelong side that had David Savinsky, God bless his soul, he's not here with us anymore, his brother Adrian Savinsky. Yes. What a hard team. George Karkaletsas was there, you know, brilliant midfielder, and I think he scored the first goal for them, uh, the equaliser at the time, 1-1. Yeah. Um, you know, great. And Steve Horvat was there, and, right, yeah. uh, Bonk and Bonk and and those, those three, four players, including ended myself, became your teammates. Nick, yeah, we ended up going to Melbourne Croatia the following year. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that that North Geelong side uh, that one, it's because it, I'm coaching there now. There's a photo of that that final of all that holding the the, the cup. So they yeah, they still hold, the coach. they they still hold that in in, in memory out there at North Geelong. The um, so the following year, now now you've moved moved to your first let's real, you could say real big yeah. club, right? Let's yeah. say big club, big club, yeah. where the 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 passion of the Melbourne Croatia fans, um, and you spent a couple of seasons there. So just talk to me, what was what's it like now? You know, you got Juventus, steep history. Uh, obviously, George Cross, a lot of passion, but now you're at Croatia. And it's a big yeah. club, massive club. So, so after those, that after that final, I had three clubs to choose from. I I had a meeting with Heidelberg. I had a meeting with Morwell Falcons at the okay. time, and and Melbourne Croatia. Um, and look, Melbourne Croatia appealed to me um, obviously because of the success that they had in just in the cup, last couple of years. The team that they had. Or was a lot further. Well, then again, Morwell Falcons would have been further, but I could have chosen Heidelberg because I, I didn't at the time. I didn't live too far, and I still don't live far from Heidelberg. But yeah, I don't know. For some reason, I thought you know I, I'll I'll just I I'll ju I'll just crash, and I had nothing to do with money because there was no money at the time. There was you know I had nothing to do. It was just more the opportunity. And Ken Murphy was the coach. Uh -huh. Yeah, and Ken Murphy was the coach. So I sort of knew. If, I think I've heard a little. I heard a little bit more about Ken Murphy than what I heard about the others. And apart from Morwell Falcons, who the president comes from the same region as where my family comes from, he actually came over to my house and Mum cooked dinner for him. Believe it or not, so we had dinner. But I was honest and upfront, and he appreciated the distance was just too far for me to travel. Going over to Croatia was probably the best thing. One of the best things I've ever did in, in my mm. football career. It was actually the best thing I've ever did. Was moved to to um you know to a big club extremely passionate club um very very different the way they operate um than what i was used to and just that just that the way they were you know you can tell they were just hard working people you know they were really good honest hard working people and they gave me uh, obviously that opportunity ken murphy gave me that opportunity to be part of the squad um and I was extremely grateful. And at the time, even Billy Rogers said, you know, this has come too late, you know, like it's come now, but it should have been, you should have gone much earlier to National League. Um, and, uh, yeah, so joining that joining that group, I, I was felt welcomed straight away. And Simara at the time, 
Um, you know, it made me feel long time extremely present there. Long time, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ma magnificent, magnificent. You know, it made me feel really, really comfortable. Um, Steve Munderkitch made me feel extremely comfortable. Uh, the players were, you know, and I'm still good friends with, you know, Andrew Marth, who I talk to probably, you know, two, three times a month. You know, we have a catch up talk, just see how things are going and so forth. Long, long, uh, you know, long life friends, you know, that you come across. And uh, but it was a really good banter. The boys were, you know, they didn't take football too serious because we had to enjoy our lives. They were a funny, funny group, probably the funniest group I've ever been been close to, but talented. I'm talking an abundance of talent of footballers, absolute talent, which makes you as a footballer grow, um, you know, and and enjoy your football a lot more because you're playing with, with talented players and it makes you become either you either make it or you, you or you don't. You know, yeah. you've got no choice. And so what year is this? This is like sort of early 90s, yeah. isn't 92. it? 92. 92. Yeah. And so this is... So I was there for four years, 92, yeah, it was basically four years. Four, four seasons, okay. Yeah. And obviously yeah. you're competing in finals... Talk, yeah, so, talk to me yeah. about who's the lineup. <laughs> which which fight? Which which final battle did you it becomes memorable to you in that time? I, that early I think the that biggest. Moment. I think the best battle, the best final was. So the first year we weren't all that with Ken. You know, once again, Ken knew how to put a team together. He had a young boys with some of the senior players. Um, was it was it Steve Hanna? I think it was one of the defenders, uh, uh, Theo Salamides was there, um, David uh, David Miller in goals, but basic, and, and Josep Biskic. But the rest were just young boys, you know, Mark Silic, Andrew Marth, uh, Mark Viduka had just joined the, the group, um, Oli Pondulyak, um, Mark Talich. It was just, you know, uh, you know, uh, Bulya Basic, you know, fantastic plays, Damien Wojtek and... Um, yeah. We, uh, you know, we got – so that, that first year, after that year, um, obviously uh, Ken Murphy was then released and they yep. brought in Mirko Basic. Yes. And our first uh, our first grand final – so that first year was done, dead and done. So the second year, we go into a, uh, a grand final uh, v Adelaide City at Olympic Park. Yeah. And Damien Murray scores almost from the halfway line, just yep. scores an absolute scorcher of a goal. We, you know, we were – we were an extremely good team. We finished, I think, first. We could have, I think, we might have finished blind the premiers, but we ended up losing the uh, the grand final that year at Olympic Park. So the following year, with now, how good was that atmosphere? Like oh. all those games at Olympic Park, and you had, you know, one side with one team and the other side with the other team, and just the, you know, like. Proper football with pro proper football clubs with a, you know you can feel the energy <laughs> right and and I find now like when you walk into a place it has that smell in the in the plaster in the bricks there are yeah. certain clubs that you just walk into and it's whether it's the smell of the chavapi or the suvlaki or the you know and and it just feels like a football club right um, this it is a it, yeah, I was going to say it has a smell of history. Yes. You know what I mean? Of culture, of history, of passion. You can actually feel and it. A, and as a footballer, it's a beautiful smell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a lovely it's a beautiful smell knowing that you know what's who's come through these dressing rooms. Yes. The the talent that's been here and now I'm privileged to be in the same dressing rooms of Existing players and previous players. Yeah, it's a humbling experience. You don't you don't get ahead of yourself because you just never you be there, right, and contribute. No. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, playing at Olympic Park and you know back then could have been twenty plus thousand people. Um, you know, people travel from Adelaide. There's no doubt about it. Adelaide City had a magnificent squad. At, you know, one of you know most of the players there played for you know the Vidmar brothers and you know and you know obviously the defenders Alex Tobin and Ivanovic and yeah. um, you know Loz, Goro Lozanovsky playing there at the time. Um, you know, the, the, I think the Foster Craig Foster might have been playing there. Look, massive, massive, You're massive. basically playing against a quarter of the Socceroo side. More yeah, or less. yeah, absolutely. So we ended up losing 1-0 that game, which is, you know, 
understandable to an extent, but you know we were, we had expectations being at home and the team that we had, we probably should have won that game. But nevertheless, that's that's football. But the following year, Buzzage, yeah. this is the this is the game where out of because then we played that was three great. We ended up playing in three consecutive grand finals because then we went back to Adelaide to play against Adelaide in another grand final um, at their ground. And uh, I remember at the time the late um, Eddie Thompson saying, you know, my my heart goes with. Melbourne, Croatia, but my head tells me that Adelaide's going to win this game at home. Well, lo and behold, we ended up winning the game 2-0, and that was big. I'm, yes. I'm talking, that was massive. I thought the Olympic Park year before was big. This was huge. I just could not believe the amount of supporters that we had, the, the, the many people that travelled, passionate supporters, and local Croatian people that came to watch with a true passion of, of football, of success, that they wanted to see this team finally win after so many years of losing those, even against South Melbourne, prior to me being there, losing at Olympic Park against South Melbourne. That was just incredible, you know, seeing, you know, Mark Vaduca. Celebrations that night? Oh, yeah. look, yeah. Look, they used to, <laughs> and the boys will understand this who will end up watching this. I, you know, they, they basically call, called me the bear because okay. I'd go, after a game, I'd go in hibernation, I'd go to sleep. I never, I hardly ever went out because I was just exhausted. You know, the anxiety of playing a game doesn't matter what kind of game, the pressure that I put upon myself, I just exhaust myself. So after a game, um, yeah, well, I'd normally go back. Now, to be honest with you, I really can't remember. Oh no, no, that's right because we flew back that same night. That same night, we flew back. This is this once again. This is just the passion of of of, of our supporters. So we finished the game. I think we might have just celebrated a little bit locally, whatever it may be, but we we're on a plane straight back to Victoria, back to back to Melbourne. Okay. And when we landed in Melbourne, oh, the we, yeah, you remember we could we weren't allowed to go off the, out of the tarmac through the normal exit. They made us come through because there were so many supporters, they thought there was going to be a stampede. And honestly, there would have been about maybe three, four hundred supporters, maybe more. Yeah. At the airport waiting for us at so we came out of the the um, the the, uh, the conveyor belt where the luggage comes out. That's where they made us come out from a little side door. Wow! Because they didn't want the supporters to go upstairs in the arrival lounge because of all the other traveling traveling people, traveling public. Okay. So they made them wait downstairs. Say, look, wait here. The players will come out of a door where the conveyor belt was. So we were there, and as we were coming back. They were surfing all the body, all of us, just picking us up and passing us on to oh, and just throwing good. us all up in the air. It was massive. It was massive. But, look, the man that they really wanted to hug was Mark Viduka. He was the yeah, man that they all wanted to grab and hug, you know, which is fair enough. He was just an amazing, amazing human being. But, yeah, that's Arguably, that's we... I mean, so, uh, so Mark grew up across the street from my house. So on Burrow Crescent in, in Keelaw and, and he went, went to North Keelaw and CRC and, and like, uh, slightly older than me and he, he'd, he'd be able to juggle the ball to school and not drop it. That's how good he was, yeah. right? So yeah. literally. Um, but, and big and strong for his age and arguably one of the greatest strikers that we've ever produced. Did you did you have a feeling when he was on that? What would he be able to do on the training pitch? Because this is the things that people don't get to see, right? Yeah. What could he do on the training pitch? Uh, like closed door session. Forget about what he did, where everybody got to see yeah. on, uh, live or on camera. Or goal highlights. Uh, would he be able to pull that same magic off at, at, at training? Just kill yeah. it, push two people off, turn, shoot, top corner. Well, when he when he came to us from the Institute of Sport, he was sixteen years old. I think it was to, going on to seventeen. He was sixteen years old, and not because and look. And any any of my ex teammates that played there, they would tell you the same thing. And not you know, I was I was you know grateful that I got to play with someone of that caliber and how, and the quality. But there and then, you could see the quality of this boy at sixteen, seventeen years old. You know, he was you know, and I was a defender. Theo was a defender. Uh, oh, sorry, it was George Hanna. George Hanna. Yeah, George Hanna, he was a, a defender. Tough man, right? So. Um, and you know, and this is this is you know, Dukes at 16, 17 years old, holding them off, you know, at training, turning them. And not because they were bad defenders, it was just because he was such a good striker. You know, he would turn me. He was just strong. He was a he was very capable at at, at 
all his uh, all his duties as as a striker. You know, he was just um, he he had a he had a a way almost like that Lawrence Kidner. He had a way to make it look easy. Mm. You know, he would turn and 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 you know and he would just weave through players. You know, pass the ball inside outside of the foot, put you through whatever it may be. But what I remember him about about Mark the most, he was a very humble. Very humble person and very happy, and he was cheeky too. Yeah, he'd like to be cheeky at times and 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 you know and stir up some of the older players in a good way, you know, in a good way because it was always this youngies versus oldies stuff. And but oh, he was always okay. humble. Yeah, it was always a youngies. So the small sided is that how you would split it up? Yeah. Youngies versus oldies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I'll tell you what, when every time we had a small sided game, youngies oldies. There's no, there was no way that David Miller would miss that as a player. He wouldn't, there was no goals. Uh, he had to play because he was talented as a footballer at okay. David, as much. Oh, I've never seen a goalkeeper with the talent that he had. With his feet? Uh, with his feet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Could, could, I actually admired watching him play. He was very, very good in those little games. At what level would he be able to play on the pitch? Like, would, would he be um, able to play well, in state leagues? <laughs> If yeah, had, oh, no, no, yeah, yeah, he'll be able to play a really good NPL. I'm telling you, he was uh -huh. very, very good. Okay. He was very, very good. Yeah, yeah, he was very good. But, yeah, no, they were, they were really good, uh, those little battles. But, as I said, with Mark Viduka, he he was talented. You can, yeah. you can just see, you know, with his, with his shooting, you know, shooting abilities, you know, shooting drills, things yeah. that we would do. Um, you know, he, the way he knew how to get around players was something, you know, and you just admired him at training. And you knew you were in for a battle every time you trained with Mark Viduka. But you know what? That's why he was he was yeah. probably the, one of the greatest that we've had with Harry Kill, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So uh, immense, immense talent. You know, you talk about next level, what he well, what he was able to do. I mean, yeah. remember those, those goals for Leeds against Liverpool? He, he basically it was Mark Viduka. I think he scored three or four goals against Liverpool. Tour. Oh, I think it was. Yeah. yeah. So... Uh, but arguably now your move, your next move to South Melbourne is where people most remember your time, right? Yes, so sure. why why the move to South Melbourne? First yeah. explain that and then give us a recap of your your, your time at, at South. Okay, so what, what happened? So my last year, so we had finished, so we had played our, our, our three grand finals and then my, which would have been my fifth year, uh, sorry, it would have been sorry, it would have been my fourth year. No, no, yeah, it would have been my, my fifth year. I um I had uh, we were talking we were you know talking about a renewal of contracts with, with Melbourne Croatia. And and you know, sort of things were stalling. And it's not because of anything. I think they were probably just, you know, weighing up their options in regards to the remuneration, how much they wanted to pay for me to stay, all that sort of stuff, not, you know, whatever it may be. Um, so I was probably one of the last players that had signed, uh, sorry, that, that were to put pen to paper. I was still one of the last players that still hadn't put pen to paper. Um, and it was one of the training sessions, I remember, one of the training sessions that we had at, um, at, uh, at, 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 at you know, at, at Summer Street there, they pulled me out of, out of the train. They said, oh, we want to have a talk, uh, you know, with contracts. You know, we want to see if you want to sign tonight. And I said, look, not for anything. I said, but I'm, I'm in a lot of training. So they pulled me out. They wanted to have a chat. And I said, look, I'm not signing anything. I said, I just want to go back out and train, you know. So I went back out and trained and finished that session and all good. I've gone home. The next day I get a call from um, Peter Philopoulos at um at yeah. South Melbourne. They said, look, we, we've been told by John Forbes at Puma that you haven't signed yet. I said, no, I haven't signed. I haven't signed at all. But I found it strange that South would call me. I thought, well, what would you want me? Because I've always believed, I always thought that the best only play at South. I didn't think I was I didn't think I was the best. I was obviously good enough to play in the NSL because I, you know, proved myself and I held my position at Melbourne Croatia. But I just always thought that South only had the best, and they did. They always had, you know, some yeah. best it, It's a big, best so it's Marconi, Marconi in, in, in New South Wales and South, no like, doubt. They, 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 they basically bought who they wanted. Yeah, right. exactly right. And I didn't think I was, I was, you know. Viable. At that level. I, I don't think I was at that level. So when they said, look, you know, we, we would like to have a chat with you on Wednesday, or I think it was Wednesday or Thursday. I said, 
I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll come across and have a chat. Um, and the only reason why the only reason why John Forbes knew that um, I did yeah, have a contract, so. yeah, it was because John Forbes sponsored um, or Puma sponsored Andrew Mouth. And when John Forbes asked Andrew Mouth, "Who haven't you signed yet?" Andrew Mouth said, "Well, they haven't signed Faustor yet." So John Forbes went, and, and Puma were the sponsors of South Melbourne. So John Forbes at the time told South, and South rang me, cut a long story short, I went, I had a meeting with them in Clarendon Street, and Andrew was there. And I didn't really know Andrew all that much. I've known him as a player, obviously, but in a personal level, I've never had any communications with him. When Ange said, look, you know, we want you to come across, and this is no word of a lie, I said, Ange, you really want me? And he said, yeah, we want you to come and play. I said, well, just give me a contract and I'll sign it. I didn't discuss any money. Honestly, didn't discuss any money. And Andrew, later on in years, went on to say that the reason why I signed this player was because I needed him, but also because it wasn't about the money for him. And it wasn't because I just wanted to play for the best club that I could, okay. you know. So and at the time, yes, was it a little bit more money than what I was getting at, at, at Croatia? Absolutely. Okay. But... That wasn't my focus because I never discussed it. I said, whatever you want to give me, you give me. I'm, I'm happy to play because I just want to play in the cell and I don't want to lose an opportunity if I can't make an agreement with Melbourne Croatia. I think, and I, I think there's, there's a lesson there to yeah. any current player who is listening. Yeah. I'm also on a board at, uh, at Western Suburbs and yeah. I do a lot of play negotiations and there is maybe an element of trust that you need to have in yourself and at the club that you're going to play at, that yeah. money can come. I'm not saying yeah. that, that it did, but you stay there for a long time. So you're yeah. obviously happy with yeah. stuff. Yeah. Right? yeah, look, amazing, amazing. You know, I joined a fantastic club. I left an amazing club and I joined a fantastic club. You know, mm. I, you know, I left some really good boys behind, but at the time, not only did I leave Melbourne Croatia, but a lot of other players had left because they had gone to play for Collingwood at the time when Collingwood came into the league yes. and Carlton came into the league. Yes. So they were, you know, so that was sort of the beginning of the breakdown of of of, uh, of Melbourne, Croatia. So, you know, we had, um, you know, uh, what's his name? Frank Urich went to Collingwood. Um, uh, Mark Silich, one of, the, one of the great midfielders, you know, he had gone to play for Collingwood. Um, Andrew Marth, Luba Lepsansky went to play for Carlton. David Savinsky went to play for Carlton. You know, uh, Adrian Savinsky went to play for Wollongong at the time. Yeah, yeah okay. So going back... Yes, it wasn't about the money. It was about the opportunity to play for the best club because I thought one day my reward would come back Got it. With, with, you know, believing in who I was and what I could do. And it's only a couple of years later, what a side. I think it's 90, uh, oh, is it 98? Massive, is it 90, yeah. 1998 is the year that you do the job with South in Angers team. Yeah, um, yeah. What a game! Talk, talk me through that 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 year and that championship. Yeah, well, see that one. There was also another three grand finals in a row. You know, so the first year we didn't do all that well, and Andrew was on a cutting. He was almost right. going to get sacked. Yeah, yeah, he was almost going to get sacked. Yeah, Look, I remember quite clearly. You know, we Andrew was out of the room. The president came in and asked us. You know, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? You know. You, you know, we're, we're 10th at the time. What are we going to do? We weren't, we weren't travelling all that well. And we and we all said, what you're going to do is you're, you're going to keep Ange. We don't want Ange to go anywhere. You know, we all backed our coach. After that meeting, we went on a winning streak. I don't re recall exactly, but we actually went really, really well. We ended up finishing, you know, up there somewhere. Another another maybe lesson for dressing rooms yeah. that uh, if you've actually got a good coach and he hasn't lost the dressing room, that's what you have to say. Yeah. So, no, uh, Ange, 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 for the time that I was with Ange, which was basically four years, Ange had never lost the dressing rooms. As a matter of fact, he grew it stronger and stronger and stronger. Yeah. You know, he made he 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 really made you, uh, you know, believe in the club, believe in the philosophy, believe in what he wanted to do. And the trust, you know, and respect the club. You know, our dressing rooms were always spotless. Players weren't, you know, we weren't, you know, not allowed, but we were advised, keep it, this is your room, this is your office, you keep it clean. And I think he continues that sort of 
Um, caliber, high caliber of standards. High caliber in the dress room uh, till today, you know, and hands where he is. Um, you know, so, you know, it, it was very well respected. And Ange was like that, you know. It, so we we just, we really respected him as a coach. So we said, no, we want him to stay. And, you know, we, we continue. So then the following year, we get in now, um, we, we get in, a, in into a grand final and, um, who was it now? Well, there's so many grand finals now, man. I'll tell you what, my, head, my, head's, my head's almost cooked and fried. Probably, I'm, I'm not getting uh, some sort of dementia or something. Or um, but, um, yeah, so, yeah, we, no, we, we ended up going into, obviously, our grand final. We ended up winning we, we ended up winning two consecutive grand finals, and I think we lost the third one. Um, uh, yeah, with Ange. It was that, yeah, it was that way around. But... Phenomenal, you know. Once again, you know, to to see Ange go in, you know, as, as a young coach, and you know, un, untried coach, obviously, and, and and becoming successful with the team that you know he managed to put. I mean, obviously, a bit of help with Frank Arrock at the beginning because he was under Frank Arrock, um, yeah. and then yeah, and then he 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 put it all together. It was just uh, great players, you know, great, great, great players. And that was Mickey P's last year, I think it was with us, because he had an knee injury. So that was, uh, you know, we did a farewell for him. But, you know, then we had, obviously, Trimmers, David Clarkson, and other players that we had there. Steve Yosafidi is an amazing defender. Yeah. Um, Nick Orlich. I mean, great players, great players. Goran Lozanovsky came and joined us. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so. he came and joined us from Collingwood at the time, because he was playing for Collingwood also. Yeah. Um, so he came across, you know, Billy, Billy Damenos, you know what a what a midfielder. You know, yeah. Paul again, Cole, that, one of those players that probably an, another sunshine boy, Billy Damianos. Yeah. Um, he uh, again that silky. You know what I mean? Some players, yeah. some play, players just do it easy. You know what I mean? You think, yeah. oh, how do just, the talent just they, they they play like effortless, and then other players you feel like they they need to work at it. There's some yeah. you know it, it's uh, interesting. Yeah, um, absolutely, absolutely. You know, David Clark's in the midfield, Steve Panopoulos. You know, another, another quality. Real solid players, real yeah. solid. And by that stage, they were, you know, they were very well experienced. We knew what to expect. You know, we knew how to get on. Look, it got to the stage where we would get onto the park. And, you know, this is not to sound arrogant or anything. But you but just knew you were going to win. You knew you were yeah. going to win. We knew we were going to win. We just didn't know how many goals we were going to score. That's beautiful. That's a great feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and then when Mickey P took over straight after Ange and Mickey P took over in 2000, it was the same feeling because Mickey, Mickey P brought on a different concept of the way he wanted the team to play and train. We at that stage became full-time players because we had just got back from Brazil. Yes. What yeah. a great experience that would have been. <laughs> I talk about, we talk about it all the time. And now that the uh, that David Beckham uh, documentary has come out, um, you know, we look back at the photos because that trip in 2000, Ange gave us the 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 ability to bring our wives or girlfriends. Yes, yes, Steve told me about that. As long as they stay in their own hotel, whatever it may be, um, they can come along and they'll travel with us on the bus. They come nice. to the games. Yeah, I mean, that was the reward that Ange gave us to say, you know what, this is an experience for all of us, not just for the club. It's for you know the family of the families. clubs, you know our, our, our wives and you know and partners who who you know help us along and and put up with everything that we need to do when our tantrums coming home, shit game, this and that, whatever it may be. So they all travelled and they all, all their all of our our partners had the opportunity to catch up with um, with uh, David Beckham and take a photograph with David Beckham. So. Yeah, so there's photos with uh, with David Beckham um, with the with the girls, but yeah, no, it was just a fantastic experience. Did you end up exchanging a shirt with any of the? Believe it or not, I had Andy Cole, and he didn't want to swap. I, was, I, I, I think me and maybe another player, I can't remember who, but I think there was a couple of us that didn't get a jumper. No, we didn't oh, get a we didn't get dodgy, a jersey. dodgy, dodgy. All right, yeah, dodgy. We, we, absolute dodgy. But and that was a one off because I think with that jumper they uh, they they were. They were in the Champions League with that jumper. They might have won the Champions League with that jumper. Yeah. But that was a one-off. So it would have been a really nice, uh, um, you know. Well, did, did, you ta- did, you, did you kick him behind play or something? Or what? Well, now that I think about it, I probably should have, knowing that he wasn't <laughs> going <laughs> to. Um, so we're, we're talking about a, a time you, you debuted late, so arguably late, 
as yeah. a as a socceroo, but you know you've already now won a couple of championships. Yeah. Um, and talk to me about how you got that first call up <laughs> uh, in the qualif. I think it was a qualifying round. Um, you know, we were in Oceana. Um, how did you get the call up? Well, actually, what what happened was the uh, there was a tournament here in um, in 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 Australia, and it was a four nation tournament, and I was a standby. Uh huh. And I think it was Ante Gench. He was playing as a left back. Okay. At the time. He normally, he normally played more forward. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Well, yeah. So, so he was playing. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure I he, he ended up tearing a ham. Uh, anyway, so I went to watch the first game. I went to watch their game at, at, at Bob Jane Stadium, and I you know said hello to Raul Blanco and all that sort of stuff, and. And Raul Blanco um, said to me, listen, we've got you on standby, so you train with us if anyone injures yeah, themselves, injured. then you step in. And Terry Venables was the coach. Yes. Okay. He had just, yeah, he was sort of been appointed as the coach. In so It's interesting you say that. Also, somebody just passed away very recently. So, yeah. Um, and I've yeah. got a fantastic photograph of me and him together okay. at, a, at my first training session with the team. And I'm holding a, a, a water bottle and he's explaining to me a few things. And it was a great photo, a clear photo of me and him. And we were training that because we used Bulleen's at the time. It was a grass pitch, Bulleen's training facilities for, for the national team. And because I lived close by, it was perfect for me. And then going back to it, I think Ante Gent ended up tearing his hamstring. Okay. So Can I got called in straight after that first game. I got called in. Wow. So, but I was always going to be... Part of the squad, but not the main. Got it. It was just and, like, and yeah. what a big personality Venables would have had. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I can tell you a story because, <laughs> and it's a funny one, and I've said this before on a, um, and one of the, um, actually when Australia when Australia played against Iran and we ended up losing, uh, well, not losing, but yeah, we ended up conceding the two goals. I was on the grandstand watching, so I was asked to be a guest speaker at a, a at a luncheon before the game. And Paul Wade was um, Paul Wade was had me and he was interviewing me and he said to me, Fausto, you told me this story about um, Terry Venables and you know what he said about you. Um, can you tell you know can you tell our guests here tonight? So what happened was while we were playing that tournament, I'd get an opportunity to play, but I was getting I was playing I was, they were playing me as a right back, and I've always played as a left back. Obviously, continue most of my career was a left back. So I thought, oh, I'm not getting much of an opportunity here because that's right, my first game was against Chile at Olympic Park. It was raining. And uh, and he played me right back. And I thought, hmm. So then we go to we go to Sydney to play a game there. And I think, again, we play me right back. And I thought, you know what, I better confront Terry Venables because he probably doesn't even know, you know. Oh, well, left back. <laughs> yeah, I'm like a left back. What am I playing right back for, you know? <laughs> you know, there's, there's other right backs. Let them play a right back, you know. Anyway. So I thought I'd go to his room, you know. So I pressed the elevator button and I'm waiting for the elevator to open up. And as the elevator opens up, it was Terry Venables in the elevator. <laughs> he comes out. He goes, oh, hey, lad, how are you? I said, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Look, I just wanted to have a chat with you. I mean, this is embarrassing, right, but I'm going to tell you. Um, no, sorry, no, it's just funny. It's a funny story. So I said, look, Terry, I just wanted to, you know, mention, uh, ask you a, a couple a couple of questions. He said, yeah, tell me, you know, and he was always open, you know, willing to speak. I said, look, I've noticed that the last couple of games you've played me as a right back. He goes, yeah, what's wrong with that? And I said, well, I normally play as a left back. He goes, right, lad. He goes, look, he has to be, to be honest with you, he goes, I don't know who the F you are. <laughs> <laughs> I go, what are you talking about? You don't know who I am. He said, I don't know who you are. He said, Rob Blanco hasn't told me anything about you, you know? And I said, are you kidding me? I said, I play as a left back, you know? So then from then on, he ended up playing with it. But that was, uh, he goes, man, I don't know who that F you are, you know? And that's how he actually said it. He goes, I don't know who that you are. I go, well, what, what am I doing here? <laughs> well, it's good that he told him. So did he correct it? He, did he, he corrected uh, it, yeah. yeah. Play, play left back. We played against, um, uh, I think, North South Korea. I think it was one of the Korean teams. I forget who it was. At it, yeah. um, 
at the Sydney Stadium and we ended up winning 1-0 and I set up the goal for Ernie Tapo to score. Oh, yeah. bravo. Yeah, he yeah. Left back? Yeah, yeah, left back, mate. mate left back. Play another lesson, players. Tell your coach, if you're a left, left-sided left player, not to play on the opposite side. Oh, Sash, you hear a lot of the boys these days, oh, I can play anywhere. No, no, no. <laughs> I always ask, I understand, but where do you perform the best? Yes. That's what you want to know. Where do you perform the best? Yeah, yes. So, yes. Yeah, and that was the national team. And you're right. I was late to the national team, but mind you, I was also late getting to NSL. You know, yeah. I came in at about 22, 23 years old. The the, the other thing too is you, always, you 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 played for a long time, so you always kept yourself fit. Any problems with injuries throughout your career or no? Look, thank God. Look, I um, as Mickey P always called me. He goes, he always called me the ultimate professional, um, and it's also always because. I made sure I looked after myself. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I didn't go out. Didn't stay out late at night. Never did. 10, 10.30, I was already at home if I stepped out somewhere. I wasn't the type, you know, I just wanted to make sure that I was always ready for whatever was put in front of me. Mm. You know, I just, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, my body was always attuned, ready to go, uh, looked after. So thank God I really didn't have the, the, the only thing I've really had was a, uh, a, a grade two tear on a medial. When I was at Melbourne, Croatia, it kept me out for about four weeks, five weeks. But injuries, you know, no, you know, no, so very focused. fortunate, very fortunate. no, 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 very, very fortunate. I am look, I only ever weighed, I weighed sixty five playing football, so I wasn't a heavy player, and that helped me a lot. Um, but yeah, I definitely looked after myself. You still, you're still very low. You'd be not far off that in playing weight now. So you're... no, no, I'm not far from that at all. You know, yeah. Although, uh, yeah. Don't move us. Don't, don't move like we do, and that's true, mate. As you get older, it all starts to disappear, you know. But um, no, no, I, I played till I was uh, was at 30, 33, 34 years old, and and that's mm. it. And then I when when I finished off with South Melbourne, um, yeah, that's when I moved on to Hodderberg for the year. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and obviously you've gone on to. Co uh, uh, having a, a, a fairly decent uh, coaching career uh, a, as well. So, um, any any highlights uh, coaching? You, you've coached that a yeah, number look, of times. I, I mean, look, I haven't. I've coached. I mean, Bulleen gave me the opportunity when um, when Serge Sabadini was the um, the director of coaching there, and, and or the TD, yeah. Um, at uh, at Bulleen. So he gave me the opportunity to take the 20s at Bulleen. So I took the 20s for a couple of years, which I enjoyed. Then I went to Richmond for one year with uh, Ernie Merrick as an assistant coach with Ernie Merrick when they had just been promoted to the NPL. Um, and then from there, I uh, I went back to my my home club, which is, at the time was Moreland Zebras, which is Brunswick Juventus. And uh, yeah, I was there for three years. And I think that the, the last year that I was there, the third year, that's when we... Uh, we made the uh, the last the last four, I think it was, in uh, in the FFA Cup. Mm. Yeah, we ended up going to Brisbane to play uh, against Brisbane Strikers, and that was a highlight. You know, bringing that club. You know, for the for the the f two years in a row, we finished second. Yeah. And the last year, oh yeah. yeah, sorry, second, third, and second. Yeah, that's where we finished. You had uh, you had Dario Vidicic one year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's yeah, the, yeah, the year. Yeah, the, before I departed, just yeah. that year uh, when I departed, I um I yeah managed to bring um, Dario Vidicic uh, across. Yeah, I remember. Very I remember nice person. Yeah, I remember watching. It's it's amazing. Like when you we see quality of players. I remember seeing you. I don't know if it was an FFA Cup game or a practice. I think it was an FFA Cup game. You were coaching at Khan Lee or Albion Rovers ground, and Dario came on as when he just, I think, just signed him. And oh, yeah, came, yes, yes, came yes. Came on yes. late. Yeah, came on late. You just see, like, he just, I think, he came on last 20 minutes or something. Just his touch still. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Just absolutely. Yeah. No, look, that was, a, that was also a very, very good team. Yeah, yeah. Extremely good team that I. Managed to put together, at, um, got together some really good coaching staff um, to, you know, to to continue. Yeah. But obviously, things didn't pan out that way, which is fine. Or it's understandable. That's part of football and part yeah. of coaching. Yeah. Um, but yeah, look, you know, bringing bringing the club to the FFA Cup, um, you know, to the extent to where we we achieved was was really good. You know, with yeah, a good bunch of boys too. 
Good, good, good. No regrets. And, um, and uh, so then uh, I think from there back to Bulleen. Yeah, I went to Bulleen, yep. And back to Bulleen and now you're at Oakley. Um, yeah, yeah, down at Oakley. Yeah, yeah. So I got a call from uh, from Archie down at Oakley and uh, obviously asked if I wanted to, you know, take over their 23s because only when they're halfway through the season um, with their, well, their 21s now, their 23s, but under 21s and, I said, as long as, um, you know, CT is happy with that, I don't have any issues, you know, I'm happy to help. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm not precious about oh, I need to coach seniors or whatever. It's, you know, if I can help, if I can help, um, you know, the kids, um, you know, progress in some way or another and become something, even with even for Oakley. But like I always tell them, don't, aim, don't just aim for Oakley, aim for A-League and don't just aim for A-League, aim for the best in the world. Yeah. You know, don't come here because you want to play for Oakley, come here because you want to play for the best in the world. If okay. you can, you know, because you should always and set ages yourself of up. Players? A, 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 ages of players, where are they? 16, 17, 18, 19, 20? Is that the... Yeah, look, predominantly we'll they? probably have the youngest this year. We'll probably have the youngest, one of the youngest squads because um, I have a lot of 18s. I've got some 16-year-olds in there yep. um, that I've chosen this year to, to be part of the squad. I think I might, I might have a couple of 19-year-olds. Yeah, maybe two or three 19-year-olds, but that's it. Yeah, we won't have a 20. Interesting. Every, everybody who said that the movement to 23s will be having 22-year-olds playing reserve grade football, and yeah. it hasn't panned out that way. Uh, most people I speak to, because I'm, I'm, like I said, yeah. I'm at North, and in the 23s, the oldest player that we have is a 19-year-old, and he's thinking maybe he goes and plays state league level somewhere. So this idea of movement... To twenty from twenty ones football to twenty threes, where you would everyone would stack their team with twenty two year olds. Yeah. But really, most clubs are looking to produce their youth, and that's that's what reserve grade football is about. Well, Sasha, twenty two, twenty three years old, are you still playing reserve football? You know, at this level, come on, you know, yeah. you should be aiming at senior level, playing a senior level, and it, you know, and they all think I need to play NPL, I need to play NPL. You know what? Drop down a level, drop down a level. In, you know, improve, play more, be successful, and you'll always come back up. If you're as good as what, you know, you believe, I believe in myself when I wanted to go to self. If you believe in yourself that you can play at the top, drop down a level, be the best you do can. Job. Someone will come and pick you up. Do a job. Go do a job. And and it's it's in, it's interesting that, let's say, for example, at that, that the highest level, let's say 20, 23s, you know, would those players be able to then displace a state two senior player? M most of them would not, no. and that's the truth. No. So, the, 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 so uh, I talk about this. Uh, you know, and yes, there'd be talented ones that that get picked up by their own club, etc. Yes. But you, you playing against boys, other shaped bodies, and playing against men who are not going to let their job their job go. You know what I mean? No, absolutely. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's a, it's a different. It's a different a mindset. It's a completely different mindset. You know, you're not playing against little kids. You know, a 22 year old, 23 would look great playing against a, an 18 year old or a 16 year old would stand out. But that's it. And under 23s, go and play in the senior environment, whether it be NPL, NPL, you know, in, you know state two or NPL two or NPL three. You'll find it. Even NPL three, you'll find it tough. You will find it tough. The, you know, so that that harder defender that will do that smart thing, check your run, hit you before you get the ball. All these little things absolutely. that are not taught until you learn in the game. One hundred percent. Whisper in the ear, saying yep. something. All yep. those things that don't yep. happen in junior football, right? Yeah, yeah, and that, yeah. And that's what I and that's I'd like to see a 22, 23 year old now playing senior football somewhere, not playing twenty three football at Oakley. You know. Unless you're registered, you know, with the seniors and you're coming down, that's a different story. But right. you're playing and training with the seniors. But if you're everyday training with the 23s, well, what are you competing against a 16, 17-year-old for? You know what I mean? Mm. How are you going to improve? Exactly. How are you going to improve? You know? Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt you'll improve one way or another, but you need to improve physicality. You need to improve with someone who's just as smart as you are at the same age group or a little bit older that you want to be able to compete against 
So, yeah, very, very, very interesting. So, yeah, you know, really happy down there at Oakley. Extremely happy. Good, good. And if there's, I mean, you've you, you've you've played, you, you've represented our country, had the honour of being a, a Socceroo. Did you keep any jerseys or any Socceroo jerseys? I've got a few Socceroo jerseys. Um, I've given away some South Melbourne jerseys because okay. some really good people that I know that are, you know until today they're still crazy South Melbourne uh, supporters. So and you know they've become good friends. So I've I've given a few away, um, but I have kept because my mother won't release them from her. You know, typical Italian de baule. You know? <laughs> <laughs> she won't release the lock. With, with the uh, the the Socceroo ones, which ones? Yeah, Adidas sponsored in that late eighties. Adidas. So which are the ones that were your favourite? The Socceroo jerseys. Well, I've got I've got both. I've got obviously the gold and I've got the blue one. So they're both. The, yeah, yeah. I've got the blue one too, which is a beautiful, uh, which is a beautiful top. But the, once again, going back those days when we were when I say those days sounds like years ago, which it was. It was a long time ago. Twenty two thousand and two was my last. Well, it was my last game with the with the Socceroos. We played out in Colombia against uh, in Bogota, and um, they never. Now they measure the players. Back then, everyone was large, large or extra large. So the closest I get to a medium was a large, and I I just look like a muppet, you know, yeah, you're swimming going them. around with an extra large, yeah, just a, a top. But yeah, no, no, I th those I can't give away. No, I've given I've given away a tracksuit, a national team tracksuit, because I've got a few of those. Because every time you go to camp, they give you another one that's extra long, extra large. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I've given those away. But no, the tops I, I I can't do. I can't do the uh, so memorable memorable times. I, I tell you, I tell you, a memorable time was playing in 1998. It, um, Terry Venables' last game for the Australian national team. We were off season in the NSL. They flew us to Croatia to play against the Croatian team that finished third in the 1998 World Cup. That was their mm -hmm. last preparation game. Okay. I think we got smashed seven nil. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you're Did playing you get on the against park that night. Did you get, were you on the park that night? Yeah, yeah, I played. I played the. I played the first half, and then and then Muskie came on for me in the second half. Do yeah. you remember who you were marking? No, I don't. I don't really. No, I don't remember. I remember. I remember. Uh, was it Sisklovic? Yeah, so Bourbon would have been in that team. Bourbon, forget it. If I tell you the score, the goal that Bourbon scored would be scary. So, so this is when football's about levels, right? And like you're you're now playing for the Socceroos, you're at a level, and then there's Bourbon, right? It's another he, level. He, it's like another level. Does <laughs> it feel like, oh, what are we going to do? Who? What are we going to do again? I hope he doesn't get the ball because he might just do something unbelievable, right? It was just amazing. Look, there was. Um, Projanevsky was playing. Yeah, Projanevsky, yeah. And I'm pretty sure it was, it was Slis. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was Sliskovic. One of those two. I went to get the ball off them, right? And they spun around in a circle and they went off. And I'm still around. I'm still going around in circles. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of those cartoons. I go, why am I going around in circles? Well, look, he's gone. <laughs> he turned me and I was still spinning and he had already gone the other way. But um, what happened was at the very beginning of the game, I'll never forget, we played at um, Zagreb's game, uh, Zagreb's ground, where Mark Viduga just finished playing his career at Croatia. It was his yeah. home ground. And, God, he, mate, and, you know, he was playing for us that day with the Socceroos, and, God, is he loved in Croatia. And, and so, and you know, and why not? I mean, what, you know, he was just, an, as I said, he was a very humble person and a magnificent footballer. And everywhere he walked, if we when we walked out of our hotel room and, if you walk next to Mark Viduka, guaranteed you're going to get a picture taken because everyone wanted to take a picture of Mark Viduka. He was the only one that could park his Mercedes on the foot on the footpath, not on the side of the road. He'd park outside the hotel room, convertible, no one would touch it. Because it was they Mark knew Viduka. it was his. They knew it was his car. So the whistle blows, the whistle blows for the beginning of the game. All right. I get the I don't know how it managed, but I whistle blow. We had kickoff. I made a run. I get I received the ball and I, and I've taken on the, the, the right back. And I've gone down the wing and I'll see Mark Viduka make a run into the box. You know, not many, but this was a successful cross that I, it was straight to Mark Viduka's feet, one on one with the goalkeeper, and, and he's kicked it and keeper saved it. Oh. First minute and last minute, that was the last minute, first and last minute that we had any opportunities at goals. Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> then they just turned it on, mate. I'm telling you. So they parked the bus, parked the bus, huh? 
to watch Boba receive a cross from the corner of the 18-yard box, chest it, left foot volley to the far corner, hit the post, hit the other post and go in for a goal. Oh, wow. Um, it yeah, was it's goal, like you're uh, playing alien. Spider, Spider was in goals. We've all turned around, looked at Boba and we're all clapping. Yeah, it's like you're playing an alien, you know what I mean? Like everyone, uh, it's not normal. And Boban turns around and looked at us and he said, I'm very sorry, boys, very sorry. <laughs> he so, apologised. I mean, no, I mean, like, yeah, so he, he meant it, but he's not thinking it's, like, it's even better than what he could do, right? It's, it was it's amazing. a free goal, freak of nature goal. Yeah, yeah amazing. It's, look, they ended, up, they ended up finishing third in the World Cup that year, yeah, 1998 yeah. in France. Yeah. Yeah. So that was an amazing, and that was just the send off for Terry Venables, obviously, and yeah, yeah, all good. But no, no, it was uh, good times. Enjoyed, enjoyed it. And like I've, I was talking to someone just the other day, and uh, about uh, I was, oh yeah, I was in Adelaide for work, and I was talking to someone the other day, and they said, oh, he recognised me through football and all that sort of stuff because some of the Adelaide people obviously still follow the football. And I said to him, he said to me, did you enjoy your football? And I said, if I could relive every single day. The same thing, not go overseas, play in Australia, go for my trials, come back, um, you know, I would relive it all over again. The yeah. same, you know, it doesn't matter, you know. Even trialling overseas, you know, it was just an incredible experience. Never made yeah. it, but that's fine. I appreciate the fact that I had the opportunity. Yeah, you know? that's, that's, that's had, brilliant. Yeah. Someone, now now I know why you were so silky. Uh, they're playing at fullback, uh, your early days, at Sumner Park, uh, playing as a as a forward, and y your your fitness level, obviously your your engine uh, yeah. to run. But you 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 had a you had a silkiness, and it's because you played up the field. Um, it's interesting um, how strikers become left backs, uh, good enough to then play for the soccer yeah. rules. If there's one piece of advice you've got now, this group, what is it that you say to that? That boy or girl who's now on the verge of making senior football, you know, because yeah. you were once that young boy trying to break into that team with Eisendorf, right? Yeah. It's that one piece of advice that you can give them. Not to waste your training sessions, to make the most of every session that you do. Pick up something at every session. You know, when, when, when the coach is set, ready to go, this is what I tell my boys, when I'm ready to go, this is the opportunity for today to learn something. You know, we have an opportunity today to learn something. Whether I'm teaching or you're learning or you're trying something is not to waste those opportunities when you're, when you're at training, really not to waste them, yeah. if I have to give you that. And most of all, also, is look after your body. Absolutely. Somebody who looked after their body throughout their footballing career, a fantastic servant and continues to be a fantastic servant of Victorian football, the great Fausto Diamichis and Socceroo. Thank you, Fausto, for this conversation and uh, all the very best for success in uh, for the upcoming year. Sasha, I really appreciate the time. It was nice talking to you and, uh, yeah, looking forward to you know, seeing you out in the field and we'll have a good chat, but really appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Bravo.